This meeting is being recorded. Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and today on Hercules and the Space Gods, I'm honored to be introducing the UFO Entity Enigma. Today we will be focusing on the cosmic realm, cosmic angels, ascended masters, and other exalted beings. And we are going to start with the incomparable, the legendary, the one and only Tim Schwartz. Oh, thank you, Hercules. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, and, and I appreciate your kind words. So um, tonight I'm going to be talking about, this is actually based on a, a, a chapter that I have in uh, the new book, the new blatant plug here, uh, Timothy Green Beckley's uh, uh, Bizarre Bizarre, which uh, just came out uh, the other week. And uh, so, so happy with uh, all the people who have uh, so far uh, got a copy, but it's very fortuitous that, uh, that you're talking, uh, you, the, your video today is, is about this subject because, uh, you know, this is something that I have been uh, interested in a long time. You know, the modern UFO phenomena is uh, full of contradictions, you know, pop culture, uh, sees UFOs as uh, interplanetary spacecraft uh, piloted by uh, human humanoid types of creatures that uh, seem to be hell bent on uh, shoving bizarre devices up whatever orifice that we have available. Um, but uh, you know, if if one were to conduct even a little research uh, beyond reality uh, television shows, it's uh, it's really apparent that there is an entire universe of weird stuff that surrounds UFOs. Um, I suppose in one way or another, practically everything that is associated with the supernatural or paranormal can also be connected to UFOs. Um, because of this, I think the simple explanation that UFOs are physical spaceships from other planets you know, we need to give it a little bit more of a, 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 a careful examination. So, you know, if you go back, really, you know, to the early 1950s, you have individuals such as George Adamski, um, Truman uh, uh, Bethram, uh, Orfeo Angelusi. You know, these guys came forward with claims that they actually met with extraterrestrials and that these uh, uh, friendly beings from other worlds were coming to Earth because of their concern uh, with our recent development of uh, atomic weapons. And the contactees were told that uh, not only would these atomic bombs affect the Earth, but they have the tendency to affect the cosmos uh, uh, kind of like a, uh, a, a like a reverberation away from earth and uh, so you know not just earth or the solar system uh, but sections of the galaxies could be affected too by our uh, atomic weapons so uh, you know since the 50 late 40s and early 50s you know this was really a revolutionary thought that we're not alone in the universe, that there are other intelligent creatures uh, out there, intelligent creatures that seem generally concerned with our ultimate physical and spiritual well-being. Uh, so um, because of this, I went and did a lot of research into the whole contactee movement and and really it's no surprise that uh you'll find that that long really long before the uh of the modern ufo era that there were people who claimed to have had contacts with extraterrestrial and uh you know while some of this was physical contacts very much like uh, uh, we have today with uh, UFO experiencers, you know, where somebody sees a, uh, a UFO come down and guys come out and they have conversation and it's uh, with, with some people it's, it's repeated over and over again. Um, but uh, you know, we also have 
religious visionaries, uh, spiritual mediums, and psychic channelers who claim that they were receiving messages from alleged non-earthly sources. Now, you know, if you remember in a, in a previous episode, I talked about Emanuel Swedenborg. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Swedenborg, who lived from 1688 to 1772, you know, he was a Swedish philosopher and a scientist who uh, began his career as an engineer and was a publisher of uh, Sweden's first scientific uh, uh, journal. And I'm not even going to be, you know, uh, try to uh, pronounce it. My Swedish is always bad. (laughs) But Swedenborg (laughs) devoted himself to geometry, chemistry, and metallurgy, as well as studies of anatomy and physiology. However, uh, starting in the 1730s, Swedenborg became increasingly interested in spiritual matters and was determined to find a theory which would explain how matter relates to spirits. All right. So in 1744, at the age of 56, he began to have a series of strange dreams and visions. And uh, even though Swedenborg had a lifelong interest in philosophy and theology, he found some of his visions to be rather disturbing concerning the way that that, that he was uh, brought up. Uh, but he did find that his spiritual awaken, awakening opened his eyes so that he could freely visit, he said, heaven and hell and talk with angels, demons, and other spirits. Well, he went to write a book and uh, translated as Earths in the Universe, and he states that he was visited by spirits of beings who lived on other planets in our solar mm-hmm. system. He wrote that all life forms that he visited in, in this solar system and beyond were humanoid in appearance, but they were not carbon-based physical life forms as we th- think about it in a you know three-dimensional reality. Uh, but they do have social and family structures. Uh, uh, they're aware of the reality that there's only one God. Moreover, they say that uh, they'll live on after their present bodies perish. Uh, so Swedenberg was really one of the first to uh, experience and write about these kind of uh, almost uh, ascended master types of of contacts from uh, uh, extraterrestrials you know so if we go and take this then uh, more to uh, 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 modern times uh, you know the, we have people who have had and, and what's uh, Hercules what's the be- best way to say this maybe they were drug kicking and screaming into the whole <laughs> Uh, uh, psychic extraterrestrial visitations type of things uh, because I've got uh, uh, an interesting story about uh, somebody who um, back in the 60s was, mm-hmm. uh, w- was playing with Ouija boards with their friends now um, depending on who you talk to the Ouija board is considered either you know an entertaining toy or a portal into the fiery depths of hell so, uh, you know, you've had a lot of teenagers over this time who split s- many a night uh, playing with the Ouija board, hoping for a good laugh, good scare, you know, maybe a little bit of both. Oh, both. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, and the Ouija board usually doesn't disappoint. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's often used in an attempt to contact those who's left the physical uh, behind. And, uh, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, they're continuing to live in, you know, another uh, uh, type of, of, of reality. But, um, you know, you sometimes it's not somebody's, you know, Aunt Maud uh, who comes calling, but uh, it's something even more strange. So um, let me look here. This comes from... A website, which unfortunately is is not around. The author, Stephen Wagner, you know, is. But this originated from uh, aboutparanormal.com, which, you know, had some really great stuff. Um, So now this involved uh, uh, Peter S., who lived in uh, St. Thomas Mount in India. And in 1964, uh, him and his friends were playing with a Ouija board when a spirit that called itself Ethan, I-T-H-A-N, 
came onto the board and claimed to be from the planet Venus. All right, so this being made a, a, a number of interesting predictions, which, uh, you know, some of them came true. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, Peter and his friends decided that, uh, you know, that they weren't going to tell anybody about uh, these experiences. So about five months later, uh, Peter's brother-in-law, uh, came from Calcutta for a visit. And as they were chatting about family matters, the story about the Venusian named Ethan came up. And this brother-in-law told his relatives that a few months back, his family had also been playing around with the Ouija board uh, when it was taken over by a spirit who claimed to be from Venus, made the same exact predictions and said that its name was Ethan as well. Wow. So here you have, you know, two different, you know, completely different uh, uh, people who, you know, had no communication with each other, allegedly having the same communications from an extraterrestrial named Ethan. All right. So an interesting thing that, that I dug up about this was that uh, um, uh, in 1973 on A Current Affair, you know, a television show that uh, uh, a very popular tabloid type of show, the announcer interviewed a Sydney clairvoyant who claimed to be to have regular psychic contacts with a being from Venus whose name was Ethan Us. Same name with just a U.S. on the end of it. So that's uh, that that was an interesting story that. Uh, you know, I don't know how how pertinent it is to, uh, uh, to to tonight's show, but it just goes to show you how uh, uh, the, the the synchronicities involved with these types of of contacts. Uh, uh, just you know, the, the, they're just all around us, and and you know, I don't know how much time I have uh, uh, left here. There's, there's just three of us, so we each have around, uh, I'm not going to contribute very much except a comment here or there. Uh, so uh, everybody has around uh, 20 uh, minutes. So you have okay. around like four more minutes, four or five okay. more minutes. All right. Well, good. I'll, I'll, I'll give you another story here. Now, this story was sent to me uh, 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 by a woman by the name of, of Gail from Toledo, Ohio. Now, this is a person that she had no interest in UFOs or the paranormal. Uh, she was a divorced mother of two children and a waitress uh, at a, a local restaurant. And uh, she really didn't have much time to do anything else except care for her family. One night as she drove home from work, she noticed a strange light in the sky that seemed to be following her, her car. Uh, of course, you know, we've never heard that kind of story before when it comes <laughs> to, to UFOs. So she said that the light was reddish in color and about the size of a half dollar held at arm's length. She said that when she was about a mile from home uh, along a particularly deserted stretch of road, the light suddenly zoomed out of the sky and possession, positioned itself directly in front of her car. Now, she said that she was absolutely terrified and the object blocked the road uh, and she had to stop because she was afraid she was going to run into it. She said the light was so bright that she had to shield her eyes from her hand, with her hand. Uh, but she said that before she really had a, a chance to react, the light just disappeared. Just, you know, it didn't, it didn't fly away. It just poof. And it was just gone. She said that from that point on though, her life com changed completely. She said that she became interested in science and math and read everything that she could get her hands on. Now she, she told me that she barely made it through high school. All right. And, uh, uh really about the only thing that she ever had time to read well you know was magazines you know she said that this was so unlike her and that uh, she was uh, uh, reading books that were written for scientists and she said the really weird thing was that she understood them uh, she noticed that uh, along with her increased intelligence she also developed a power to heal and to tell what others were thinking she said it, it was as if the UFO awakened some part of me that had laid dormant all of my life. She said she couldn't explain it, but I know deep inside that I had been chosen somehow. 
She said that she had the feeling that some other intelligence is guiding her develop to develop most, both mentally and spiritually, and that she feels that she has some mission to fulfill for mankind in the future. She says, I don't know what that mission will be. I only know that I am not the only one to be contacted this way. There are thousands, maybe millions of others on this planet that are being prepared for something truly great in the future. And I'm going to leave it at that, Hercules, because that's something, considering all the stuff that's going on in our world right now, it's it's something to contemplate. And, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, it, it, that may not be a bad thing for uh, uh, the, the future of mankind. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks for having me on. That's an excellent place to leave it. Uh, I'm just to make a couple of quick comments before we move on to Nick. Um, there is a wide body of ancient literature that's there and it's been analyzed by scholars that talks about the, the planetary spirits and uh, um, different types of cosmic beings, including their association with uh, the mythic gods of uh, Greek mythology and, and uh, so forth. And again, I, I'm very surprised uh, um, that again, it's there and it, it, it's obscure knowledge, but it's, it's been analyzed again by scholars uh, for centuries. Uh, so part of what I've been doing is I've been like trying to focus on this uh, literature uh, and, and like with Swedenborg, it, it talks about meeting with people from different worlds and they all share information on the world. Uh, they also um, are concerned with various things that people on earth are doing and uh, they're here to guide us in our evolution and, and so forth. So uh, the, John Keel uh, in one of his uh, books, I think it was Disneyland of the Gods, says it's like a phonograph <laughs> playing over and over and over again since the dawn of time. And uh, I know through meditating, and I've, I've spoken to other people who've meditated or do other uh, things with altered states, that there's kind of like a, a cosmic theosophy channel uh, internally. So if you meditate enough, you'll tap into this ancient wisdom, and then it's remarkably consistent. Not that it's 100% consistent, but it's remarkably consistent uh, throughout the, the, the centuries. So... Um, uh, it could be that uh, what, what we're all experiencing in our own way or what we're all investigating each in our own way is this phonograph or this recording or this cosmic uh, radio station and what its ultimate purpose is, whether to entertain the gods as some people believe or to goddess in our evolution, that it might be open to debate. But the fact that it's there is proven time and again, and it's interpreted differently each time it, uh, it's experienced. So thank you very much, Tim. That was awesome. My pleasure. And now, Nick Curdo. I cannot begin to say enough good things about Nick Curdo because it would take up the whole hour. So Nick is awesome. And Nick, the baton is yours. The check is in the mail, my friend. Thank <laughs> you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> oh, man, what a great subject this is. I mean, this is just one of those subjects that it will always be there. Uh, for me, as one of the top subjects you could possibly talk about, I can't ever get enough of this on all the different levels we're, we're speaking of. Um, I want to start at the very beginning, and you're going to have to indulge me here, but uh, uh, I, I, as far as I know, what I'm saying is, is, is true. I remember being born. I remember the fact that all of a sudden, I was thrust onto a cold, hard surface and that my protective walls, my protective universe was gone. And it was a frightening experience. Now, some people have said, yes, you can, you can really remember that far back. I think you can. And I, it was a frightening experience. And it was, it, I, I felt non-protected all of a sudden. Like I didn't know what was out there. And the cold surface was jolting to me. Anyhow, for what that's worth, I want to share that with you. Um, I've always been very interested in the truth. And, you know, you have to be, what shall I say, uh, courageous. Because if you're believing in something, and then you find out that it really isn't true, are you going to say, uh, I, I just don't want to hear the, that kind of truth. I'll just stick with what I know, what, I, what I've been told. Or you're going to say, all right, you know what? 
I got it wrong from my teachers or my minister or my rabbi or whatever. I'm not believing that anymore. And so I, I'm going to I'm going to seek the truth on uh, any levels that I can. I'm going to be doing a lot of research. And, and so that's a very I, I admire anybody who says I'm really a truth seeker and I want to know the truth and let the let it let it land where it may. So. Uh, anyhow, I was born uh, and raised a Roman Catholic. My, my father and mother were both Catholic. Uh, my aunt, one of my nuns, was a nun in the Catholic Church. Uh, when I was like 17 or 18, I considered being a priest uh, for a little bit. And then I realized, I just, I just don't think it's right. I'm going to change my, my focus and go to something else. And uh, I've always been interested in the creative thing. So art and music and theater always were there for me, that I always enjoyed that very much. The experience of creating always, to this day, is, is something. Now, when I was searching for the truth, um, as I got older and I was the, um, you know, the uh, in college, uh, I, the Newman Club was there. The Catholic Newman Club was in a lot of colleges. I was I was the president for, for I think, two or three years. So, but at that point, I was really questioning a lot of what the teachings were. Uh, I, I came from uh, Boston when I went to college. I immediately got in a Greyhound bus with my plaid suitcase and my portfolio, and I went headed for New York City to begin the rest of my life. And here I am. I've been here for many, many years. And um, I also, in New York City, one of, my, one of my goals was to look for other spiritual callings, other religions, um, other ways of thinking, uh, other, other kinds of people. I really wanted that, and this seemed to be the perfect place to do it. Um, so after a couple of years, I I left going to um, uh, the, um, uh, the the church, uh, the Catholic Church, and I went looking for something else. And I ended up uh, at the um, All Souls Unitarian Church on the Upper East Side here on in the seventies on Lexington Avenue, and I was attending there and. Uh, as you probably know, every Sunday they'll read from whatever books uh, or, or uh, information that they have that they feel is of value. So they were reading everything from the Torah to E.E. E. Cummings to the Bible. It goes on and on and on. And I, I thought that was an amazing education and that kept my interest. So I was there every Sunday, just about if I was in New York, I was there for the service uh, on Sunday morning. And after going there for two years uh, for that particular service, at the very end of it, where they had read from a lot of other books, uh, the minister said, for our last reading, I'd like to read from the Urantia book. And I thought, I've never heard ever of something like that. I thought Urantia is such a funny name. Maybe it's Eastern Indian or, or something like that. Well, he read a couple of paragraphs. Uh, it was totally silent. It was, it's a very big church, every, very quiet. And I was absolutely stunned by what I was hearing. It leaped off the page to my very being. And I thought, what in the world is this? And I was trying to remember the funny word, Urantia, Urantia, so that I wouldn't forget it when I got back home. I wanted to write it down. Um, after it was over, he uh, dismissed everyone, said the, uh, the service is over. I stayed in that church for about 20 minutes alone in the pew because I had really felt as though I needed to recover. It was a feeling of recovering from something that I had always looked for and I believe I had just found. It was an amazing moment for my life. I went home. I, I, I wrote the, the, the ranch phonetically down. And uh, very shortly, there was in Midtown um, a, a whole uh, weekend of, uh, uh, the, of uh, exhibits and lectures on all the subjects dealing with uh, paranormal and uh, religion and everything else. And I went to that because at the time, uh, my, my, uh, my, my partner, uh, Jeff, was dying of AIDS in our apartment. We had taken him home from the hospital and he had very little time left. And he said to me, would you go to uh, the, uh, the, the Midtown uh, this weekend? Because there might be some information on new AIDS research. Uh, I, could, I would do anything for him, of course. And I said, of course I will. And I did. And I did find a few papers on the subject. But then 
there was a door that said spiritual. I opened that door. It was a large room uh, filled with different booths of, of every imaginable kind of spiritual and religious uh, uh, dealing. So there were people with pamphlets. And at the very end of that, at the very end of that very big room was a big sign that said, U-R-A-N-T-I-A, Urantia. I went, oh, oh whoa. <laughs> so like a heat-seeking missile, I, I went right to it. And people uh, in route were handing me brochures. Hell, take this, take this, come back to our roof. I said, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I got there and uh, there were a few people uh, uh, that were there at the uh, Urantia table. And I said, uh, hi, folks, I've just learned about this book. Uh, I don't know anything about it except what a little bit I heard. I really want to know more. And I got to tell you right now that those people are all my dearest friends, my dearest, dearest friends. I feel like family to every one of them. And one of them said, it would be our honor to answer any question you may have. We'll do our best. But in five minutes, we've got the big stage for half an hour where we where it's our turn to do a little presentation. Would you like to go to that and then come back? So I did, and uh, the, and they got up there on that stage. And again, I went from the back row of that place to the front row so I could hear even better because what they were saying was ringing true to me. Uh, oh boy, I think I'm in the right place. And I went back and I pounded them question after question and relentlessly. <laughs> they, they were amazingly wonderful and patient with me. Uh, anyhow, to make a long story short, I've now been studying the Rancher book for about 35 years. Um, I have run uh, a Rancher study group at the center here uh, in the village of Manhattan for a while uh, before the venue closed because of covert. Um, there was so much in the Rancher book dealing with, uh, for instance, one of, the, one of the chapters was called the government of another planet. Oh my goodness, that, I've been reading that now. I must have gone through that maybe 25 times. I had a lot to say. And the one, one thing I can tell you from that, from that particular chapter was they said the highest crime in our, in our planet is public betrayal, public trust that has been betrayed. And our government is very much uh, about that. Okay, can you imagine if we had that mandate for our planet and all of our our uh, governments of, of, of the world. Can you imagine if that really were true? I don't think we'd be in the situation we are now. A lot of people have said to me, Nick, that is the blueprint of the future. Uh, do I believe that? I do. I think it would take something like that. Anyhow, another part of the book said something so interesting that it kind of flew off the page. It said, uh, angels are, can act as transports, transports physical transports and they said uh there, there's an explanation of how they can take you when you have passed on to go to another place take you in in kind of a spiritual way but your your physical is there somehow uh in a, in a different material a different form and they said our our artists have always pictured angels as having wings and they said in that would be, uh, 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 of course, uh, understandable, but they really aren't wings at all. They are friction shields. Friction shields because of the, of the uh, different things they're going to encounter when they leave here. I thought that was amazing to say that. And there's a, there's a really detailed description of all of that in there. Uh, again, it, those things kind of leap out. Um, when I was a kid and they were talking about angels that appeared uh, for various reasons and uh, knowledge of different people, principles in the, uh, in the Bible. And I thought that was also, that wasn't from here. That was from other, another place. That was a little bit on the extraterrestrial side. So those things are kind of coming together in a way, uh, blending, so to speak. Um, they talk about miracles. They talk about uh, in some cases, uh, time and physicality that can be sped up and changed th that would appear to be something that would be a miracle to us, but it was actually a physical thing that was that was done. Uh, I think that's quite interesting, too. Uh, in the Urantia book, they talk about when Jesus came out of the tomb, he, he, he uh, 
he obviously he, uh, he, he, he he was there again. He 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 was uh, amazingly back. A lot of people didn't recognize him, uh, and they said that he looked similar, but not really quite the same. And the book is talking about something about marantra, marantra material that's similar to what we, but it's not skin and blood and and, and bone. It's another material. And they said that that also has to do with when we ascend, we're made of a different material, but that we would know each other very, very well by our personality. They said personality in the book of Urantia, they say that doesn't change and you will know each other by your personality, first off. Nick, we have five more minutes. Okay, there's a lot to cover. I'm just going to take a little bit, but I thought that'd be interesting as, as kind of a backup. It um, is, thank you. It has, it has, the Arantia book really has my, my, my imagination and my interest, and um, it's, it, it continues to, to, to this day. Um, I even designed a, uh, a complex that would be called the Arantia Center, because uh, I had architectural courses, and I thought, what would, what would it be like to have an actual place for the Arantia book to be uh, talked about, to be, to be read, and other spiritual gatherings of different other faiths and spirituality to, to meet in a place like that, that would be very futuristic. It's a series of domes. It's a series of uh, layouts of a, a, something called the Crystal Lake. It's got places to live or to camp, as well as uh, theaters, uh, as well as a school and a library. Uh, there's a whole uh, thing. And you can find that by going to uh, Urantia Center. Dot com. I believe that will get you right in there. And there's also a, a short video and a PowerPoint presentation. And I just wanted to put that in there because I would love feedback of what you think, uh, how, how, how close did I come already to what it might be like. So anyhow, I just wanted to put that out there. Your Rancher book is your Rancher book dot org, O-R-G. And you can go in there and you can read the whole book or listen to it. It's all recorded. Thank you, Hercules, for the time. And thank you, Nick, for that uh, introduction and overview, not only to your own experiences, but to the Urantia book. Uh, the Urantia book is an example of uh, uh, celestials giving us a book. And that's happened throughout our history with uh, you know, very many uh, holy books. And a lot of them have very consistent uh, messages. Okay. So uh, uh, regardless of whether it finds what one is looking for in the Urantia book, the Urantia book is definitely an example of something that has been going on in the religious history of mankind since its dawn. And uh, it, it's still going on uh, today because the Urantia book was uh, given to us fairly recently in terms of human history. It was actually published in 1955, but it was uh, originally started to being downloaded by a particular individual from Chicago in the 20s. So it's been a long process. It's a 2000 page plus book. It is a very big, very big and impressive book. And uh, they have put uh, versions of it online. They put audio, uh, visual versions. So they make it very easy for you to, to, to get into it. Thanks again, Nick. Pleasure. Thank you for the time. And last but certainly not least, Mark and Phyllis Springerhoff. Phyllis, who we will see her hands or feet or uh, you know, part of her blouse or, you know, so, oh, oh. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. we're greatly honored by that. That was not a meme or a little, uh, what do you call this? Avatar. <laughs> Consider yourself lucky. <laughs> we are blessed. Thank you, Phyllis. And, <laughs> oh, Phyllis, Mark, we do, we do. <laughs> Nick's Mark, funny. another example of, uh, he, Thanks Again, for something that the celestials have given us since the dawn of time uh, is incarnate celestials who speak to us directly uh, rather than pointing us uh, to you know a book that uh, act as a conduit uh, to forces beyond our, our ken. So we have uh, Mark representing that. And uh, Mark, what is uh, your perspective and that of uh, your celestial brethren and sister? Well, I was trying to figure out what to say and start, but since I come from a different level and different, a different, different place, different and um, I, I, everybody, you guys know I'm a walking, which means we don't call it that on the other side. We call it transferring, but here they call it that for now, which means it's over a body that was dead. 
And uh, I remember everything from before I came here and way before this galaxy. So what we're all talking about, I deal with these people and our friends on the high realms and higher levels. I come from a level that's the 12th and up. Now, come down to our first plane here. This is the heaviest, densest level on the planet, physical on this planet. So a lot of the people or beings that were coming to the earth million years, millions of years ago and thousands of years ago would be physicals like us right now. So they're coming from either galaxies or solar systems from the galaxy here that were physical, dense people. And so that would go into the ancient gods and the ancient people that were, you know, good or bad, battle war, whatever they were doing, they were setting up different colonies at times on this planet. And, um, and, and with the people that were on the planet, they were either utilizing them to help, uh, and I hate to say it as slaves, but it, it did happen. Uh, they wanted the people to do things for them and they would reward them. Uh, and the better uh, you did, uh, the closer you got to them in rewards or, or getting closer to their, uh, let's say their bases or whatever they had on the planet at the time, which were just man-made things. They made things from stones and wood and everything else so that when it, when it would go, it would just come back to the planet and anything metallic they had, they'd take with them, it would dematerialize it just like that. So there would be no remnants of that. Yet in upas, like out of place objects or artifacts, we find odd things in geodes that are millions of years old. So this is showing how the planet has gone on you a couple of times. They find technology. Technology, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, like they found battery, but not like a, you know, a cat battery here that we have here, the you know, easy electric batteries. They had different things that they set up, but it was something of a battery of sorts that was being utilized about a million years ago from other races here that were here. And the planet flips and the geode forms, takes a million years or so. So that, that little thing was in there. Other things have been found too, um, besides that, like uh, other stuff. But getting away from that, the people we're talking about, the celestials, including the angelic realm, called messengers in the ancient times, right? The, if it's messengers from the creator, there would be an angelic being. If it was a messenger from space, it would be a space being, and they might look like an angelic being because of the energy around them. You could do and this is, us. I gotta show you how. This is uh, Archangel Mikiel. Mm -hmm. That's showing us the form he takes to show to us. And, uh, these angels do not look like us at all on the high realms, but they take the form for us to work with them. And on the 12th dimension, 10th and up uh, planes, we work with the angels in different ways. And uh, we have planetary angels like our Earth. And the angel's name of our planet Earth is not Gaia. They made that in 1970s. But Alishiala, that's her name. And she's a planetary angel. And uh, we can even meet with her. You just talk with her, call on her name. Uh, but she goes by every, she'll let, goes with the people who call her Gaia. It's okay. She loves that. It's okay. But I'm just letting people know these are, they're planetary angels. They're not gods and not goddesses. They, they operate with the planets. There's galactic angels, there's celestial galactics, there's solar angels that work with the stars and the suns like ours. So we have planetary beings that are angelics. And the being we know as Pan, who I love dearly because I've met him physically, is an archangel. Pan is an angel, an archangel of nature, not just on our planet, but throughout the universe or the universe. So he's that archangel. That will be in our upcoming, I'll have that in our nature spirit our books. But book. He asked me that 1976 to tell people that in the future. This is Archangel Mikiel in a, a form he showed, and he was holding that lighted torch. And uh, this has a three-way energy. Again, they use these, they're metaphoric looking too, but yet they do work on their realms when they come to battle other creatures or lower dense, lower uh, negative beings that work with these densities where they were cast to. I've met many beings out there in space. I physically met Ashtar. He really exists. But, uh, again, and some other guys. When are, you say that, friends. you, you, you yeah. actually have to say which level you met them on. Because... Okay. When he, they, they uh, took me on the ship from Central Park. And to be on his level would be an etheric level that he was... Uh, the ship was morphing with thin through. So uh, for me, I was on a ship as me, but I know I, I was translated in a way that my frequency would be acclimated to theirs. Then they teleported me back within, but well, I, well, it was 20 some odd minutes 
up in the ship, but in time lapsing here, it was so, like no okay. time for Let, me. Let's clarify that just a bit. So what uh, we frequency, call ascended master types. What, what frequency would you say that ship was, was um, oh. manifesting on? Would you say it was manifesting on a first through a fourth level frequency? Yeah, it appeared on our, so we can see it in the sky. Anybody could, would see it. That's a physical manifestation. Yet the people inside were in a higher fifth dimensional or sixth dimensional frequency. And that's, and uh, seventh as well. So they can be in there as they teleport a person like us into it, a physical, we can be translated into the frequency that they have. And there's a way that they do it with the frequency exchange so that we're on the ship physical like we are and yet lighter, but, uh, and you can walk and touch things and everything. So that's how they will teleport people out if they need to rescue us in the future from other kinds of disasters, which we've done in the past. This is one where we came in the past. This is how it's done. We'd send the beam down, and it's a large beam, takes a big giant area. And everybody who had people in the space who have a high frequency, who have light colors and thoughts to creator on their mind all most of the time, anybody in that high frequency of healing, love, oneness with nature, loving all, uh, will be teleported onto the ship in the same way I was. Uh, then uh, but the people of evil into satanic stuff or just evil uh, will not go because their energy field won't make it to that frequency and they won't be able to handle that frequency. So they'd be actually sick. They would not be able to come on that ship. Not to say that in the future, they won't have some physicals that are in ships, physical density like ours. And they will also take people on if they need to, uh, who cannot handle that higher frequency that are good people. They might not have a total belief system going totally in their mind, but they won't be, again, they won't rescue the satanic type people because there's no place for them in, in the areas where we come from. So all this low level here, heavy density here on this physical density planet, other the old throughout the universe, that's many universes, this physical density exists. And that is where the physicals will mingle and go through whatever life they want to do and what they're doing till what is it, every incarnation and things like that. So there could be negative people Negative beings influencing, they were fallen as we call them, or lower astrals we call them also, to manipulate people. And they manipulate the people on the planets, many planets, they've done this. And uh, so when the, the people on the planet suddenly just all come together in, in thoughts at least and call to creator or call out to creator with the white, light, light, if you want to say white light or whatever you want to say, and call out, come help us. And that's why in the ancient text, you, you might read the creator says, I heard that my, the blood of my children, I heard their call. That's those who have been murdered as well. And as the children are calling today in uh, different parts of the world, calling out to creator to help, help them and help will come. Creator doesn't back off, but there is things going on in this planet. So we can't go into that. And what's going on with the karmic thing going on. Um, the, most people would say that the people I met Ashtar and all, but would be ascended master. And in a way you could say that they are uh, space beings, teachers of space and uh, way over the idea of what we call on earth a master, but they can come through in different dimensional spaces and materialize the body and then dematerialize and go back. Okay, but what was, uh, I think just for the, for the audience, the, just a little description of the word ascended means that, that you don't have to incarnate back on to planet earth again to the first level but it doesn't necessarily say which uh level you're ascended to so you may have some uh, quote unquote ascended masters that have only ascended to the fourth frequency. we have a little drawing we created to show kind of that i don't know if it's seeable like this is earth where we are today this is the dark shadow area that's the lower energy frequencies that are surrounding this planet, which it we is, would call the second plane, which is like, which is where the negative beings and lower astrals which hang if, out. If you look at it this way, you could see how people get trapped. Yeah. Between that and the third, the first, the, the real first heaven. The third plane would be like your first access to the heaven, first lower heaven realms. Yeah, you know, there, there's no badness on those levels. Uh, there, there's no people hurting others or killing people. That happens on this density here. But you can be manipulated and tricked within that second plane right there, that gray one. That's where they get manipulated and tricked or get chased by monsters or have daggers thrown at them and things like that. And they run because they're just having fun with the person. But as soon as the soul turns around and acknowledges it, 
and says, get out of here. I'm, I'm the child of the creator. They have to, they back off. There, there are things that we teach about other stuff, but I'm trying to get into, trying to get to the ascended master effect here. Um, like when I had an encounter with my friend on the ship's Balthon, that was a, in Central Park, that's my bad drawing. Um, Balthon, like good drawing. Well, <laughs> well, it's like, it's reversed, but in, in the original picture, I'm on the other side. So I don't know how this, you guys see it. Maybe they, you see it right. You may see it right. Maybe you do. Well, Balthon was over uh, almost seven feet tall when he showed up, materialized, and just started walking very slowly towards me. An Ethereum, high Ethereum being coming into our physical density, materializing, um, takes a while for his first time. They, they have to acclimate themselves to the energy frequency and the density that they have here, suddenly a heavy with, heaviness with their bodies. On the high realms, we don't have a heaviness with the bodies. We can be 12 feet and plus but there's no heaviness. You, you, you don't have the organs that you have in, the, in a physical density body. You have a heart center and a, a brain, a head center, like we call it the seed atom center. So what happens is um, Balthon appeared sluggish and stuck trying to walk to me, smiling, took forever to get towards me. And he sat down right next to me to show me he was physical. He pushed his leg against the bag I had with my camera equipment and he pushed it into my thigh. So I felt it. So he's sitting there at, trying to ask me to um, he wanted to um, interview me. I don't want to go into that story. It's on our website, intergalacticmission.com, under encounters. But the thing is, is when he finally got up, when I knew he was going to leave, he got up and I said to him, thank you for coming. And I put my hand out and he didn't know how to shake my hand. And he actually went, didn't know how to, how to do it. Sometimes they, they forget to teach them that in case they meet people. But... What's funny is the space handshake is, show them Phil, is palm to palm like this. This is how we do in space. So your palms down, thumbs down. So he tried to shake my hand like that. He came at me, Phil's with me, and he comes at me like he, he was doing one of these. And finally, um, he went like that. And then I, we turned, his hand was huge in my little hand. So I felt him, he shook my hand gently. I said, God bless you for being here. And he says, God bless you too. And then he walked, turned around and walked and took forever for him to walk. But again, I knew by watching what I was seeing, but the reaction of dogs nearby or people, nobody saw him. Now that's what the other thing these Ethereans and these masters can do, these teachers, they can appear to you and no one else sees you, sees them with you. Or they can appear to two of us, let's say, and nobody sees us. Uh, talking to somebody invisible, they'll be looking at us and we're talking. And, and really they will allow the irony, to show the irony is that is that he appeared physically to you, yeah, and they still couldn't see. Yeah, him. that meant he was blocking a frequency so that they can't see, which they can do. Um, which <laughs> we know, I know they do that because we've done it in the, uh, on the ships to do that with people. So the thing is, is this um, uh, this happened to Phyllis's sister. Yeah. And uh, what's the date we had? Oh, July 9th, 2016. My encounter with Balthon was 2015, August 10th. This is a drawing I did for Phyllis's sister, and that's her sister there. That's Ashtar. These are three beings she met in a store in Connecticut. She came out of an aisle and nearly walked into them because she got one item she was looking for. And she, these guys are like seven feet tall. They're just standing there. She almost like comes out like this and it opens. Oh, into the almost into the guy, and she looks up at the guy, and she telepathically says to herself, "I wonder if these are the tall space people Mark think, talks about because she's listening to our she listens to our shows." And when she said that, looking up at him, he the dark haired guy with the, like a beard looked down at her and smiled. Now this one here is sis, my, our sister Cece's guardian angel. And this one here was an angel that came with that alien. We'll call him the alien for now. But he's he would be like Balthon's friends up on the ship around the earth up here. That's he invisible to would us. Would be considered physical. an ascended master. So he would say, oh, yeah, he came in. Now, she had the same kind of an experience. The people in the store didn't see these guys, all three of them. They, were, she, they followed her online to check out. And the light girl checking her out didn't even look up to see if anybody was there. It, most people seen somebody that tall. And the outfits they were wearing actually made no sense 
That's the casual wear we use on ships, on the spaceships. This is casual wear. They wear a slip-on shoe, and these the angels do the same thing. <laughs> now, he was wearing all gray and a dark, um, dark gray, and this guy was wearing a lighter gray, and he was blonde, and he was wearing a, a more of a light gray, too, or a light blue. And uh, he had a pattern on his shirt, this shirt. She said it was a dramatic uh, looking of uh, uh, geometric, geometric yeah. pattern, a beautiful little art design, but very there, but not too bright and bla blazing. Well, that's we the have design. We have five more minutes, Mark. Okay, that's the kind of design they will use to keep their physical bodies acclimated that they've just made. So they utilize it as a battery, let's say. Balthon had something similar. He was wearing a space age suit that didn't match anything from Earth. Yet it was hot, hot weather. In the weather for Cecile's uh, people, it was hot weather too. And they looked about 25, 28. None of them talked, none of them had watches, none of them talked with each other, it was all telepathic. So I'm just showing this, but again, people don't see them, other people. So they've always told me from my encounters with them, those will see who we want to see. And uh, I don't know if we've covered everything oh, well, yet. You know what's we have angels here. You know, oh, wait a minute. What's interesting about uh, my sister's experience is that she then had a lucid out of body. Oh, right. With that person who, who, whose name is was Zaren. I Zaren. Think. And um, she, he's actually her soulmate on a higher plane of on consciousness. On a higher plane. And he wrote to her on a blackboard, I love you, I love you. And so she was when in a classroom. She, she and leaves left. here, when yeah. she leaves here, she won't be coming back either, and she'll be with him. She also had a lucid out of body when walking in a giant corridor in, in a ship with a tall person she, she was noticing she was holding hands with, but she was her walking. So I said she was on the ship. This is to give us an idea of what an angel looks like, how they appear if they want. They could have any color skin tones, any shade, color, eyes, and hair. Uh, I'm trying to give you some ideas for anybody watching. But um, uh, so about Ascended Masters, we were saying sometimes, depending on the level that they get to, the Ascended Master type being calling themselves Ascended Masters can be from fifth or sixth or seventh, right? Not, or even fourth. And they can maybe come through here. So if they're up on the higher realms, way up, we, I got this is sold. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, way up in the cosmic realms. These beings where we come from, this is where I come from. Uh, that's my home. We traverse these air, all these realms. So in a sense, if we show up physically on the planet Earth, which we have in the past, that walked the planet as a high Ethereum coming through, like Balthon did, um, you would be a physical person to talk with. You don't have to eat, but you could if you want a little bit of like something vegetable or water, but you don't really need to. But some, if they stay longer, will eat something, usually a vegetables or some kind of juice and always water. And uh, but they usually have their things. on. We were going to go into other things with uh, George Van Tass with the Venusian that came to him. But this is it. We okay. have enough topics to last us a year and a half. And then I know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a to be uh, continued. You covered a lot of uh, ground today, um, and uh, again, it's uh, it's very uh, fascinating uh, what you're sharing. And it, it is, uh, although it differs in some details, it's very consistent uh, with what other messengers yeah. have uh, given us. Uh, you're friendlier than most, and uh, a lot less paranoid. Yeah, uh, no. My, my my encounters on the spaceships. My first physical encounter was at five years old. When I was on the ship in the fields of where I lived, and I went on a few times after that at different age times, age group, my age was different, uh, but um, it was um, most loving and beautiful experience, and the people are wonderful. They are not of this earth, but and so are you. You're 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 a wonderful, loving person. You're very creative and you're very generous in sharing uh, your experiences and your, your understanding. So we're all very fortunate uh, to have you as uh, part of this uh, discussion. And I think even though we didn't plan it this way, we had several different perspectives uh, represented in terms of the uh, celestial beings, whether they be angels or masters or you know whatever designation we give to them, uh, we got to see them from different uh, angles uh, through everybody's presentation. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody. Uh, we're going to go around to share your contact information um, and uh, to also share what uh, has, is new and exciting or what you're working on that we should be looking uh, out for soon. And we'll start again with Tim. 
Uh, thank you, Hercules. Well, uh, right now I'm uh, uh, stumping for our new book, uh, Timothy Green Beckley's uh, Bizarre Bizarre. Uh, this was a book that uh, uh, Tim Beckley, myself, and Sean Castile were in the process of working on uh, at the time of, uh, of Tim's unfortunate uh, passing. So Sean and myself uh, finally were able to get it uh, finished and uh, just got it uh, uh, published really last week. So you can find it on amazon.com. Again, that's uh, Timothy Green Beckley's uh, Bizarre Bizarre. My website, as always, is conspiracyjournal.com. All the weird news and information that they don't want you to know. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Nick? On mute, there I am, uh, for my email, uh, N-I-C-K-N-Y-N-Y-1. And that's not O-N-E, it's the numeral one at gmail.com. Repeating it, N-I-C-K-N-Y-N-Y-1 at gmail.com. I would love to hear from of people in our audience, if they have a question or a comment, whatever that is, I would very much enjoy that. Right now I'm working on an art show. It was originally uh, a dream that I had over a year ago that was quite, uh, I think, profound. It, it really uh, uh, it was like tapping on my shoulder and saying, uh, you need to do this art. It was in my dream. And I ended up that I'm working on, I've got about 40 uh, now on canvas, and I'm looking for the right uh, art gallery in New York City. The, my, my work, you're going to see it, will be highly stylized, it will be highly political, and it will be a crazy, crazy, hysterically funny. If, if you can imagine, all of that is, is in these art pieces, and I think that it's going to be a pretty interesting uh um, a journey for me to go into this art area right now. So I'm working on that right now. Also, I'm working on a uh, another song. I wrote one song called We'll Stand Up for America, which is a patriotic song. And I'm working on a couple of more right now. So that's, that's immediately what I'm doing. Thank you so very much. And just like I want to cover Tim's uh, new book in a podcast, I'd, I'd love to cover your art show uh, in a Zoomcast maybe. And this way we can... Uh, uh, see the actual uh, pictures. Excellent. Look forward to that. And Mark, how can people enter your world and Phyllis's world? And, I, and I'm still bowled over the Phyllis, Phyllis showed her face today. So thank no. you. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> really, we see the blonde hair. Um, we're Mark underscore Brinkerhoff. I mean, I'm sorry, Mark Brinkerhoff at yahoo.com is my email. Uh, that you can reach me at on all our websites, intergalacticmission.com, markbrinkerhoff.com, that's the art website, and uh, inter, in, uh, etuniversalzone.com, uh, where we have our podcasts and, and everything there, with and eventually, messages and everything. I will update fairyreality.com uh, dot com. once we get the, the fairy book done as well. We're, yeah. we're, we're working on some... We're working on a bunch of books with the symbols as well, the omniversal symbols, which actually work and we've had friends test them, so you feel them. I've felt them, but Phyllis has done them to me and I've been other places. She would be home and she would draw them on me and I was someplace else and I felt it and I knew what she did. Okay. Anyway, but beside that, we're gonna, we could do uh, for people, I can give them spiritual consultations where I can talk with your archangel, uh, I mean, sorry, guardian angels. And I got archangels in my head, guardian angels, um, higher self. self and or, people that maybe come through in your oversoul as well and i can see past lives for them as well as i can interpret their dreams if they have any kind of strange dream i i get the download of what it all meant and um i used to do i used to do pastels of people's ours but that's a long time ago so i think that's basically it right right yeah, I think that's it that's it that's how you reach us thank you hercules for this oh, day uh, this actually, is great you can you can uh, follow mark on facebook oh yeah follow us on facebook just Mark Brighoff. You see UFOs. You're at this bald head there. <laughs> thank, thank you, Hercules. <laughs> to all of you, thank you. And uh, I created a Facebook group. There aren't that many people in yet, but uh, people are coming to it. It's uh, Hercules and the Space Gods. Uh, every time we have a show that I post, I post in there a link to it and the days when we usually do this. And uh, you are all invited. I think that uh, some of you are there. Uh, and use that to advertise anything you're doing. 
because uh, you're the celebrities uh, for that uh, particular endeavor. So uh, please share everything you'd like uh, to share. Uh, and uh, this way we'll help get the message out there. And as you all know, if you send me something to post, I will post it and share it on my, uh, my timeline. Um, Hercules, is it, is it Hercules in the space gods.com? It's Hercules Invictus uh, and then the dot dots, I guess, semicolon or colon. I always keep forgetting whether the dot dot is uh, what it is. And oh, it's uh, Hercules oh, okay. Space Gods and it's on uh, um, Facebook. Facebook, that's where I found it. Okay. I, I thought there was a website specific as well. I, I have a website, but I haven't touched this since 2017. It's, okay. Uh, so it has lots of posts on Facebook. Facebook pages if you know where to find it but it's 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 not doing very much okay. and uh, just to share uh, i'm currently working on uh, a piece uh, on uh, alien artifacts from antiquity uh, so i'm jotting down ideas and playing with that and i'm working on a chapter for a book on theurgy theurgy is an ancient uh, uh, greco-egyptian practice of bridging the divine with uh, the uh, uh, physical and it touches upon a lot of the topics that we touched on tonight, except that uh, th they didn't really consider these uh, beings to be from outer space. You know, they, uh, they had other explanations for them. So uh, I'm currently working on the, those things and uh, I'll be sharing more as these things become more and more solid. So again, thanks to everybody who participated tonight. You're all awesome. Thanks to everybody who'll be listening to this, hopefully by tomorrow on uh, YouTube. And thanks to all who will be listening to it uh, after that. Uh, I enjoyed tonight and I'm looking forward to our next one. Good night, everybody. Joyous journeys and amazing adventures. Good night. Good night. Much love to all. Bye, Nick.